Well, good afternoon or good morning. <laughs> and I thank uh, the Korean Global Forum for Peace uh, for hosting this and inviting us. And I thank all our panelists and discussants for uh, coming. And uh, what we'll do is uh, we're going to begin right away with uh, uh, our first uh, presenter, which is Ke Kevin Gray. And then afterwards, each discussant will have five minutes. And uh, I'll be a little bit strict about that. And then after five minutes, uh, we, we'll go on to the next presenter. And then we should have about a half an hour for an open discussion. And uh, so I would like uh, our first presenter, I'm going to ask each presenter to introduce themselves. And our first presenter will be Kevin Gray from Sussex University. And his paper is State-Owned Enterprise Reform in North Korea and China. Okay, okay uh, just sharing my screen. So thank you. Um, so as Michael says, my name is um, Kevin Gray. I'm from the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. So uh, I just want to spend a bit of time talking about the uh, reforms to um, state-owned enterprise corporate governance that have taken place uh, under Kim Jong-un. Uh, as I'm sure most of you listening will probably be, be aware, uh, last year in April, there was a revision to the North Korean uh, state constitution, which um, removed reference to the Taean work system and replaced it with the new uh, socialist enterprise responsibility management system. And so this was significant because um, the Taean work system, of course, introduced in the 1960s was kind of like the flagship um, institutional innovation of uh, Kim Il-sung. Uh, and, and, and the very fact that Kim Jong-un um, or his government was able to, to remove this and replace it with the, the, an alternative suggests that perhaps Kim Jong-un is not um, so much uh, committed or beholden to his father and grandfather as we might have believed. And it, 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 the very act of this constitutional revision suggests that um, we may have some new answers to this question of whether North Korea is following a Chinese um, style path. So I talk, talk a bit about this. I mean, the basic principle behind reforms in a system like North Korea or any sto state socialist system is, is that there's really only one direction for reform, which is uh, uh, decentralization of, of decision-making rights down towards localities and enterprises, um, and by extension, a kind of ab abandonment of this uh, principle of equalism, we can call it, uh, within state socialism, and uh, also an increase in, in material uh, incentives for managers and, and for workers. So the way that, that this happened in China was that, um, for example, in the 80s, you had the introduction of this um, dual track pricing system, which was where state and enterprises were able to sell any production above their target on the uh, open market. Um, they were given greater freedoms to um, purchase their own inputs and uh, make decisions over what commodities to produce and at what quantity. Um, they were also given a right to retain a share of the profits and 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 thereby had more freedom to um, reward both managers and, and workers for improved performance. Um, there were some rudimentary um, efforts to introduce the labor market, but they were quite limited up until the, the, the 1990s. And so basically what I would say is we can see exactly the same principles within the um, socialist uh, uh, enterprise responsibility management system. So um, uh, you may be familiar with this, but but the, the reforms that have been carried out um, since Kim Jong-un came to power involve um, a formal reduction in the scope of the, the sort of the central index, which is determined by the central state. Um, many of the items that were under that index have been sort of devolved into a new uh, enterprise uh, uh, index. Um, and that's ostensibly is meant to reflect um, enterprises' actual conditions uh, 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 more perfectly. Um, enterprises also have been given the rights to establish uh, contracts with other enterprises on a, on a sort of horizontal uh, basis, so they can use these contracts to sell their output or, or, or get the kind of input inputs that they need for production. Um, and part of this is also a shift away from in-kind targets towards um, 
cash-based targets. Um, and there's also um, an increased flexibility in the way that the state adjusts whether enterprises have met their targets. And the reason why this is important is because often the state fails to provide the kind of um, the, the funds or the materials that the enterprise needs to meet the central index targets. So what's happened is that now if the state fails to provide what the, the needed inputs, then the enterprise does not have to supply a proportionate you know, um, propor uh, proportion of the um, of the central target. They can then sell any goods that they made through acquiring materials on the market, on on the market at market prices. So there's more flexibility there. There's a shift in the tax system away from the what was called the earned income tax, which was established in the early 2000s, which was a tax on on net income. Um, which uh, so that that was a situation where the cost of production. Uh, excluding wages were deducted from the enterprise's income and then a proportion of that became the state payment um, uh, uh, portion but that created a kind of um, tension between the interests of the enterprise and, and and the state and there was this constant haggling over how to value the cost of production um, so what's happened with these new reforms is that um, the state payment tax is calculated as a proportion of the gross income so that gives enterprises added motivations to try to reduce their costs of production rather than uh, exaggerate them. So there's that change. Um, and also, um, as I said, enterprises have increased rights to set prices for goods at, at market prices and, and, and the, the trading in, in cash uh, uh, can, can, can take place. Um, the enterprises are also now um, officially allowed to sell directly to other units such as wholesalers, retailers, um, General markets as well, uh, state-owned enterprises can set up stools, market stools in the general markets. Um, and uh, finally, um, perhaps one of the most significant things if we think about systemic change is that um, there is now a, a legal basis for the Tonju uh, investors to uh, invest in uh, enterprises. At least that's what it states in, 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 the, in the law. So that it, it's referred to as the, the idle funds of citizens. Um, this was a practice that was already established anyway, but, but, but it's, it's, it's something that, that, as I say, now has a, has a legal basis. And also enterprises are now allowed to um, establish multiple bank accounts. And, and some of these bank accounts can be used for um, depositing cash related to market activities. So there's, there's um, some of this sort of minor details are different, um, but, but the basic essence of the reforms, I would say, is, is pretty much what we saw in China in, in the 1980s. Um, so, as I say, decentralization of decision-making rights and uh, increased incentives for state-owned enterprises, greater recognition or use of market dynamics. Um, now, there are a few points, though, that we can sort of um, have a look at here, which are quite instructive, though. I mean, one, one, one contrast between the reforms between North Korea and China is, of course, North Korean reforms have much more of a post hoc character in the sense that many of the practices that were uh, sort of legalized were um, actually already taking place because there was a de facto process of marketization in North Korea following the collapse of the economic crisis in the 1990s. Um, but that's not to say it was completely reactive. I mean, certain measures also provide new opportunities. I just mentioned about the, the, the new banking rights of enterprises. Um, and also, uh, simply legally recognizing investment by Tonju is, 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 is quite a significant recognition of the social changes taking place as well. Um, so there's a recognition of, of, of the role of private capital. Of course, there's beyond that, property rights are, are still somewhat vague. There's no mention in the law of, of what rights Tonju then have if they invest, but, but, but then that's not so different to China in the 1980s either, where, where property rights were kind of uh, murky. And we might also point to North Korean state-owned enterprises lacking any sort of uh, ability of, of the enterprises to lay off workers, for example. But again, China also had similar uh, limitations, uh, at least until the 1990s, as, as, as I mentioned. So in a sense, there's, there's, there's a recognition of the market here. Um, of course, by recognizing the market, what the North Korean state is doing is, is also trying to bring the market into its own sort of regulatory uh, sphere. OK, so it's, it's, it's recognizing that this stuff is happening anyway, but, but, but that the, the state, for its own interests, you know, the state is chronically lacking in capital. It wants to tax 
those market activities and it also you know wants to just 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 bring them out of the realm of of, of non-state sort of corrupt uh, economic activity um but what one thing should be recognized in the north korean case is that these reforms are in a sectoral sense limited they apply mostly to enterprises that are sort of partly in the central planning system but but also in the market. But you do, of course, have a big strategic sector within the North Korean economy, uh, um, uh, you know, steel and, 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 and basic heavy industries, for example. Um, these kind of en uh, enterprises tend to still be firmly within the state plan and get their materials from the state. So the socialist enterprise responsibility management system probably doesn't really apply very much to them. And also local... Um, businesses, particularly in the service sector, often tend to be completely within the market. So some of the measures don't really apply to them either. So it's, it's, the, there are sort of sectoral limitations to, to, to how widely these uh, reforms um, apply, despite the fact that it's mentioned uh, you know, quite clearly in the, um, in, in the constitution. And also, of course, there are <clears throat> sort of what they call the privileged economy, you know, um, I think you know, rather than un under the cabinet, you have um, sort of enterprises that are uh, owned by the party and the military. Um, and, and then uh, there's a big question about to what extent these reforms actually are close to those enterprises. And also um, consistency, as we see in the Chinese case, is a very important um, factor in the su success of uh, reforms. Also, what you have in North Korea, um, particularly documented by defectors, you know, the, the important role of um, sort of ad hoc taxes that are paid to the state, often referred to as um, revolutionary funds, loyalty funds, social task funds, these kind of things. And, and these, these can be quite sort of irregular and arbitrary sometimes. And there's absolutely no, no mention of that in, in, in the law. And so we can assume that these kind of things still uh, take place and they're still going on, which is a, a kind of shortcoming of the, uh, uh, the scope for the reforms to have their kind of um, uh, desired effect. I just finally, I just want to um, just raise one point, which is I think is important. And, and, and there may be something of, of, of a fallacy in, in looking at reform measures in two countries and then assuming then that, that if the reforms are similar, then the outcomes are gonna be similar in terms of economic performance. Um, and the, f the first thing <clears throat> we can think about there, I mean, first of all, um, I mean, China's economic success was not really from the state-owned enterprise sector. It tended to come from outside the sector, whether from the economic dynamism that was created by the rural reforms or, or foreign invested enterprises, these kind of things. And, and state-owned enterprise reform has, has still been a, a kind of tricky issue. But also, uh, and, and China has many kind of historical legacies which account for its particular economic success. So it would be a problematic to simply think that that would apply also in North Korea if North Korea adopted similar reforms. Um, and, you know, there was this point made by Sachs and, and Wu in the early 90s that, that um, you know, structural factors make a difference, right? Um, so um, China, in a sense, was still a rural country in the late 70s. It was approaching development in the first, for the first time, if, if you see, uh, see what I mean. But in North Korea, it's more of a challenge of, um, I should say, structural adjustment, really, you know, urbanized, industrialized economy. Uh, and that's, that's much more of a tricky, particularly politically, um, uh, uh, thing to do. Um, uh, but but perhaps uh, and and there are interests against that kind of structural adjustment as well um, and and perhaps the more important parallels are between um, North Korea and China's northeastern uh, uh, Rust Belt basically where state-owned enterprise reform hasn't been particularly successful there's been somewhat lackluster economic growth and, and North Korea shares these kind of characteristics you know there's actually a kind of post-colonial attitude towards foreign investment which doesn't help either um, so, so so that's to say um, the reforms themselves are different but we have to also take into account the very different context and I think um, I, I've probably used up my time there so I, I, I will stop thank you and thank you and um, thank you for adhering to the time. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Our, our next speaker will be Dr. Uh, Professor So Jean Lim from the University of Central Lancaster, who will discuss the 
SDGs, Accountability and Fragile States, A Case of North Korea. Professor Lim. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, let me share my screen first. Okay. Um, before I start uh, my presentation, um, I think uh, we did not have an introduction from Michael himself, whilst he introduced ourselves. So uh, I think uh, I can take the opportunity to introduce our uh, chair in the session. So uh, my Professor Seth is the author of the book uh, North Korea and also the history of South Korea and uh, 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 teaching in the uh, James Madison uh, University in the States. Thank you very much uh, for uh, Michael to, chairing, uh, to chair this session this morning or early morning or in the afternoon in Korea. Um, my presentation is based on my recent, uh, uh, recent research about the paradox of uh, sustainable development goals and uh, how uh, certain countries have been left behind. Um, the very basic assumption started from that the sanctions do not work in the case of North Korea anymore. Um, for me, uh, simply um, the sanctions have been imposed in a way to stop the uh, regime, the current uh, Kim family regime. But even though it has been there, it looks like it's been um, given more harms to the people than those targeted uh, uh, individuals. And recent uh, reports from the UN or the academic journal papers or other individual reports uh, imply that sanctions do more harms to the people. Um, and because of that, uh, it needs to, we need to have the kind of impact uh, assessment whether sanctions really work or not and how it have it uh, influenced to the life of people in North Korea. Then I thought about the SDG. Now we are kind of well uh, familiar with SDG uh, because we had MDG before and uh, we are now having SDG and it's been already five years since it was adopted in 1916. The main value of the SDG was to leave no one behind. But North Korea's people in North Korea uh, obviously have been uh, left behind. The current sanction regime uh, imposed by the United Nations now has been widened compared to that uh, which was in 2017, for example. Uh, the sanctions uh, before 2017 was so-called uh, smart sanctions, which targeted specific individuals, commodities or institutions. But now the sanctions have targeted everybody in North Korea. For example, now uh, we are facing the harvest time in North Korea, but because they couldn't have enough fertilizer in the uh, agricultural sector, now people will have uh, more um, difficulties in having uh, enough food for themselves. They can't have their own uh, food. They don't have any uh, reserves. So that kind of uh, issues are there. So um, I was thinking then how we can include North Korea within this SDG frame by using the accountability uh, mechanism. The accountability mechanism in development studies field uh, show that it has three stages and sanctions is at its uh, last stage, which is at enforceability. So we uh, had, for example, like NPT before or six party talks all these kind of um, stages in uh, responsibility and answerability um, did not work well. So now we are having the sanctions in North Korea, but by changing the mindset and then bringing the paradigm shift, we can see better uh, results for the people in North Korea and also in non-security sectors. That is the main uh, argument uh, in this research. Then uh, the other issue came out whilst I was doing the research, the fragile states. We have now several fragile state index indices and all of them um, indicate that North Korea is a fragile state. And the, uh, the criteria does not only show that um, whether the country or regime is strong enough to sustain the system, but it's also uh, having the area of society and uh, people. 
So because of that, North Korea has been um, categorized as a fragile state, even though uh, its current uh, regime and Kim family uh, looks like quite um, strong enough to sustain the current uh, state. And because of that reason, um, in a traditional security field, it, uh, it's very arguably uh, assessed that, examined that North Korea is not a fragile state. But if we combine all these different kinds of factors into one, North Korea has, has been uh, categorized as a fragile state. And in the SDG uh, frame, in the implementation process, it is clearly stated that uh, fragile states needs to have uh, different approaches uh, compared to the rest of the developing countries because there is a reason why the state is fragile. So that uh, kind of uh, approach needs to be reconsidered when we uh, take North Korea in the development uh, assistance. Um, and in the SDG, uh, as a accountability uh, mechanism, it had has the so-called follow-up and review architecture. So every year, the voluntarily uh, countries uh, submit a report about the progress of SDG uh, implementation. And I will show you a bit later on that how North Korea has tried to be a part of it. So up until now, um, based on the theories and all this existing literature, um, I kind of uh, figured out that um, at the moment, North Korea and the sanctions regime have been under the pu uh, punitive accountability approach, but we now need to think about how the constructive accountability mechanism can be put and applied under this current situation by taking a uh, different or tailored or even trans transitional approach um, to North Korea, uh, especially uh, when we think about the people there. The North Korea, uh, as I said, is a clearly a fragile state, not only from the uh, different various uh, indices, but uh, also uh, from the uh, factors like how much is resilient to, for example, natural disasters such as floods. We already saw it in uh, the late 1990s and even recently, not only the COVID-19 situation, but also the recent three uh, typhoon uh, hit North Korea. Now North Korea uh, is struggling a lot. So these kind of uh, factors uh, affect uh, North Korea and it's really difficult for North Korea to sustain by itself. And also uh, on top of that, the current sanction regime affects to the, uh, the people's life. It's not only about uh, the Pyongyang or the people uh, who has a free privilege. And North Korea tried to uh, produce this uh, voluntary uh, report to uh, United Nations. Uh, it was supposed to be in nine, 2019, but uh, now it's been postponed to 2021. And I'm pretty doubtful whether we can have it by then because now we don't have not many uh, staff members uh, left and working in North Korea because of the COVID-19 situation. They all evacuated earlier on in this year. Without their help, North Korea would not be able to produce this report. And within the uh, recent uh, report um, written up by UN and North Korean officials, they clearly matched the SDG target, SDG indicators goals with their situation. So it looks like North Korea tried to be engaging in these international uh, norms and uh, global goals. But um, now, because the situation is different uh, um, compared to before, it will be really hard for North Korea to go back by itself. So we need more people from outside into North Korea. And because of that reason, uh, current sanctions do not help at all. So in my conclusion, we need to change our paradigm from traditional security to non-traditional security if we really want to see the North Korea working as a, a proper normal country because it's about people, not it's only about the Kim's family. And uh, before we uh, discuss about denuclearization and sanctions, we need to think about the reality. Um, for me, it looks like North Korea is the de facto nuclear state because we now have people who know, have the uh, technical uh, knowledge and we can't remove those people and they have facilities. So it's rather freeze the facility rather than denuclearize if it's possible. And 
human rights issue is uh, really important in North Korea at the moment. And now people defect from North Korea for having more freedom rather than because of the economic situation. So we have a different generation in defectors as well. So this is the change of the society in North Korea and then we need to uh, reflect the changes uh, into the current uh, sanction regime as well. So uh, if I go back to my initial questions about this research, can we still apply a discourse to North Korea even under sanctions? Yes, but uh, by addressing non-traditional security sectors then in what context and how this could be done in interweaving SDG accountability and fragility and by using transition or tra transitional constructive accountability mechanism, which will be like this way. So in the responsibility um, uh, stage, uh, we need to have more engaged that which means we need to uh, lift sanction even partially it would help. Then we have more people from outside into North Korea not only in Pyongyang, but um, in most of the places uh, in North Korea. Um, and also uh, kind of culture of accountability needs to be uh, shared within North Korea. And if it doesn't work, then we can have a snapback process afterwards, uh, going back to have a full sanctions, but at least we can try the new uh, uh, atmosphere there. Then uh, at the answerability stage, we can bring up with the transitional accountability not having full accountability, which uh, because uh, North Korea doesn't have a capability to address full accountability yet. So uh, sector by sector or step by step um, accountability as a transitional uh, uh, period can be there by having incentive mechanism. So if it adheres the uh, promise that we can have uh, more financial support or um, more support to the capacity building in North Korea. And even for the enforceability stage, rather than have a punitive approach, we can try constructive approach. So uh, if they are here, uh, what they've been uh, promising, uh, then we can review current sanctions regime and then we can even have full lift of sanctions. So this is the uh, end of my presentation and uh, that was David's uh, conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Lim. And our next presenter is Dr. Ki Park from Harvard University. And his presentation, well, we have it right here, Humanitarian Aid to North Korea, the Health Sector. Dr. Park. Self, that would be helpful. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Let me first begin by thanking the organizer of this, of, of this panel for inviting me to this uh, panel team of experts. So, the five uh, suggestions uh, uh, from my talk. So, it's this. Uh, back. Okay. So first, for the DPRK, health has always been and continues to be priority. And second, international sanctions have a deadly impact on the vulnerable population of North Korea and make sense during a, a global pandemic. Number three, DPRK accepts international health assistance. We know that, but it is not dependent on it. This may explain why sometimes reject assistance. And for over time, we believe that measures to prevent the COVID-19 outbreak may actually be worse uh, than the disease in North Korea. And lastly, health can be a bridge to peace. So how do we know the country values the health of its people? First, as a socialist country, DPRK's constitution guarantees universal and free medical care. Second, despite limited resources, the health system it operates efficiently and effectively. The health system in DPRK is highly centralized and well organized with over 300,000 health care workers taking care of the population through a referral system going from uh, section doctors to re-clinics, county hospitals, provincial and national level hospitals. For example, the tuberculosis program funded by the Global Fund and implemented by the WHO and UNICEF, it gets top marks for the mortality reduction scores. 
while spending half the budget, half the money per patient uh, at a global average. So third, the government allocates significant portion of their budget to health. So our analysis over the last 10 years or so, we estimate that the DPRK government spends between a one to $1.8 billion a year on its health. So it's important to note that the spending has been sustained even when they were increasing nuclear and missile capabilities and while the sanctions are being ratcheted up. And then fourth, during my 20 visits to the DPRK, my last one was, was less than a year ago in November, I've seen the renovation of the operating rooms in the, in, at the Pyongyang Medical College Hospital, development and manufacturing of local ultrasound machines for local consumption, uh, investment into a working prototype CAT scanner, and successful surgical implantation of domestically engineered and manufactured artificial knee joints. All of this costs money. When the Chinese reported the outbreak of COVID-19 in Wuhan this January, the DPRK government actually shut the borders to China even before the Chinese shut the borders, uh, locked down Wuhan. The government is deadly serious when they say that the prevention of COVID-19 entry of the virus, right? The virus entry into North Korea is a matter of national survival. The, this takes, this prevention strategy and measures to keep, it, uh, keep the borders country safe takes priority even over its, uh, its economy. There's been a 74% decline in trade with China since this year compared to last year. And government is not showing any signs of relaxing its border restrictions. So as you may have also heard that the government has built a medical oxygen generation plant and plans to open the new massive Pyongyang General Hospital by October. These observations lead me to conclude, at least right now, the prevention of pandemic is their top priority. So how do the current international sanctions, some of the harshest in history, negatively impact the health of North Korean people? Well, despite stating that they are not intended to harm the ordinary people of North Korea or hinder the delivery of humanitarian aid, we believe these sanctions may have caused deaths of thousands of North Korean people, many of them children and women. Our analysis of the impact of the, of the delays of the exemptions process and the funding cuts to, to the UN's humanitarian programming for 2018 found that over almost 4,000 people may have died as a result. And these sanctions also shackle the DPRK's ability to maintain its health system. For example, I've seen more and more medical equipment idle, mostly. These are imported equipment. They're inoperative since the hospitals would need to resort to basically smuggling to bring in parts to repair their machines. The collapse of the banking channel and de-risking by financial institutions leave DPRK often with shady options for purchasing medical supplies and parts. So earlier this year, the U.S. publicly and also privately through a letter from Donald, uh, President Trump to Chairman Kim offered to help the DPRK with the response to COVID-19. While the DPRK did not respond to the direct offer of assistance from the U.S. government, they did reach out to China and Russia, as well as their international partners and health sector for supplies related to COVID-19 response. To me, it's, you know, it's unfortunate that the UN Security Council Sanctions Committee did not grant a general waiver of all items related to pandemic response. Rather, they have chosen to expedite these exceptions. In the face of an international health emergency, which this pandemic is, the failure to remove all barriers to fighting the global health threat in the name of international security is morally reprehensible. It is important to note that China and Russia appear to be flouting these sanctions by not seeking approval at the UN Security Council level when they sent in COVID-19 test kits and other supplies to North Korea. So why does the North Koreans, why do they turn down offers of assistance from the US or even South Korea? Are they, aren't they desperate for help? Well, I don't think so. The figure on the slide shows the total dollar amount of all foreign aid to DPRK since 2000. Please note that foreign aid includes things beyond medical care, things such as food assistance and water and sanitation. As you can see, there are some years where aid reached half a billion dollars, but that was right after the famine in the 1990s and early 2000s. By the mid 2000s, the aid has rarely exceeded $100 million a year. And more importantly, over the last five years, total aid has been hovering around $30 million a year. 
that translates to just over a one dollar per North, each every North Korean person, and that is before subtracting the operational expenses of these agencies. The DPRK government has become immune to international aid. Of course, the government will accept assistance when they qualify based on their income level and disease burden. So they accepted assistance from the Global Fund and the Global Alliance for Immunization and Vaccination because they're eligible. And they saw that they saw these organizations as multilateral humanitarian organizations, which were theoretically shielded from political influence. But in reality, they are not, at least not in the Global Fund case. The Global Fund pulled its grants out of North Korea for tuberculosis and malaria in June of 2018, stating concerns of allocations of resources. It later came out that the decision was due to pressure from U.S. and Japan. The DPRK did not come to the negotiating table desperate for the, 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 the global fund to resume the funds. In fact, an independent investigation exonerated the government of the North Korea of any mismanagement of funds. The global fund ultimately ended up resuming the grant at the end of 2019 without any significant concessions from the DPRK. I believe it's a terrible mistake to use the flow of humanitarian aid as a lever for coercion. For one, the DPRK does not respond to it, but more importantly, the UN agencies, they provide a lifeline for the most vulnerable population of North Korea and all legitimate humanitarian programming should be fully funded and all barriers should be removed. But even if all barriers for international assistance were to be removed, this, this pandemic has introduced a whole new challenge. The all out zero tolerance prevent the virus from entering the country at all costs strategy by the DPRK. While these measures are highly effective in preventing the virus from gaining a foothold in the country, it will eventually degrade the health system and make lives much harder, especially for the poorest. We believe these drastic measures over time will have a greater health impact than the COVID itself. So according to the modeling study by, by Imperial College in the UK, if there were to be an outbreak of COVID-19 inside the DPRK, the best, best case scenario with active suppression, testing, isolating, and contact tracing, and also mitigation, social distancing, and restriction on movement, perhaps as many as 7,350 deaths can be expected. That's best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, with no suppression and mitigation measures, which is highly unlikely in the North Korean context, they can expect up to 158,000 deaths. However, as the pandemic rages on globally and DPRK maintains a strict prevention strategy with border restrictions, our preliminary modeling estimates up to 93,000 non-COVID excess deaths can be expected each year. The reason for these deaths are due to degradation of health system, reduction in access in the healthcare system due to social distancing and fears, and increased poverty due to economic losses. Furthermore, the programming by the humanitarian aid organization targeting the most vulnerable have come to an almost complete standstill due to inability to rotate staff, restrictions on domestic travel, and massive backlog of cargo waiting to enter the country. There is an urgent need to address the wider health implications of the COVID-19 prevention policies. So um, I will close with a note of hope though. The global pandemic is a non-traditional threat it is an external threat that cannot be stopped using guns and bombs. In fact, all countries working together, including adversaries, is our best hope in fighting the virus. We are as only as strong as the weakest link, and it is in everyone's interest to help the weakest. The DPRK may have successfully prevented the virus from entering the country and causing a major outbreak for now, but this comes at a steep cost both economically and eventually in human lives. The achievement of health security is a shared interest by all and can open doors for genuine cooperation, which in turn can lead to building trust and opening the doors to diplomacy and eventual peace. Thank you. Mike, you're muted. Dong Jean Park. And I'm sorry, Dong Jean Kim from Trinity College. 
And uh, Dongjin, you want to begin? Thank you very much, Professor Seth. Uh, my name is Dongjin Kim from Trinity College Dublin. And thank you very much for your thought provoking presentations, Professor Gray, uh, Professor, Professor Lim, and Dr. Park. I cannot agree with you more on the fact that the utility of sanctions as well as their morality is, is debated in the context of North Korea. Uh, the debate is not really new or does not just concern North Korea. According to the UN list, most of those who are uh, currently under international sanctions are fragile states uh, suffering from ongoing poverty, protracted conflict, and authoritarianism. And there is also ongoing criticism that the sanctions rationale about the utility of economic pain demonstrates how sanctions are actually a form of violence as opposed to the claims that sanctions are a nonviolent alternative to military action. And international sanctions against fragile countries could cause death and suffering uh, through structural violence on a scale exceeding the unfavorable alternative of war. And furthermore, as in the case of North Korea, Civilians could be more greatly affected than the military and the elite, especially those heavily dependent on the societal safety net provided by international aid. And as Dr. Park and Professor Lim pointed out, uh, the humanitarian impact on civilians seems to show a contradiction between the UN pursuit of political goals utilizing sanctions under the UN Charter and its parallel commitment to the human rights provisions of the Charter. And criticisms of uh, this uh, indiscriminate uh, impact of the comprehensive sanctions, especially in the case of Iraq, prompt to, prompted uh, the international community to seek for a targeted or smart sanctions. Uh, however, despite the introduction of more targeted sanctions, critics could argue that the sanctions have not been not only um, ineffective in changing the behaviors of the target states, but also failed to put an end to humanitarian damages. And furthermore, the targeted sanctions regime have, have become once again increasingly comprehensive and punitive as in the case of North Korea since 2016, as Professor Lin mentioned, um, and, and almost 90% uh, of North Korean trade is currently under multilateral sanctions, while the majority of the populations are exposed to public health risks as we've heard from Dr. Park, despite uh, the humanitarian exemption process, the UN Security Council sanctions committee. And in this sense, I have some follow-up questions to our speakers. Uh, first, Dr. Park, I cannot agree with you more that international support will be high value and may open a uh, diplomatic path to uh, sustainable peace. Uh, but at the moment, as you said, it's very difficult to send humanitarian aid to the DPRK, especially for US NGOs, as well as South Korean NGOs, and not just because of the sanctions, but also because of those our DPRK partners are not willing to accept the aid, and not only one from the governments, but also from the NGOs. Uh, there may be various reasons, mostly related to uh, the COVID-19 situation, but also political reasons, as you mentioned. The gatekeepers of the humanitarian aid are multiple, uh, such as US government, South Korean government, and the DPRK government included. Uh, and their decision-making process is more often than not based on the political positions, not humanitarian values. And, and what would be practical and innovative ways for the NGOs to communicate with our North Korean partners to resume the humanitarian aid pro provision? And my question to Professor Lim is about the utility of the SDG discourse. I agree that SDG is still meaningful and useful framework to discuss, discuss the humanitarian situation in North Korea, especially when the key difference between MDGs and SDGs is the incorporation of the discussion about the issues of peace and conflict in the development cooperation. And as you know, the lack of MDG achievement in conflict affected fragile countries was alarming. And now SDGs has pulled 16 on peace, justice and strong institution, and SDG 16 plus captures the interlinkages between the SDG 16 and all the other SDGs. But there has been criticisms that SDG 16 is not so much about peace, but, but just about liberal state building. And in terms of UN DPRK strategic framework, it's only mentioned in relation to gender issues and human rights, not in any relations to the issues of peace and conflict on the Korean Peninsula. 
and SDG critics would say SDG is so state focused with top down approaches without reflecting on the local context, geopolitical conditions, or unjust international system. Would there be a way to include the, uh, the Korean uh, peace process context and the issues of international sanctions in a strategic dialogue about SDGs in the DPRK for the next UN DPRK strategic framework after 2021? And finally, there have been speculations that uh, the recent in intensification of China and US rivalry appears to de uh, incentivize Chinese cooperation with the comprehensive sanctions on North Korea. Uh, Professor Gray, I would really uh, uh, love to uh, hear uh, from you about your thoughts about uh, the impact of uh, this changing or not changing geopolitical condition of North Korea uh, on the domestic uh, decision-making and implementation process of ethnic reforms. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, our next discussion will be Juan Blick uh, from the European Union. He's in Brussels. Juan. Hello. Oh. Hi. Um, thank you all uh, for inviting me and I'm very pleased to be here. I'm Juan Blick from the uh, Department for Development Cooperation at the European Commission. And I work with the DPRK portfolio. So um, I'll just start with the brief EU policy background. The Commission currently doesn't really have a formal policy and cooperation strategy for the DPRK. And interventions are managed in line with the 2011 EU guiding principles for EU policy towards the DPRK. And the Council conclusions of 2017, which reaffirm reaffirm the policy of critical engagement. So this policy of critical engagement involves maintaining pressure through sanctions and other measures while continuing limited ongoing support in compliance with the sanctions regime. Um, the Commission's Director General for International Cooperation and Development, known as DEVCO, funds a humanitarian aid program in the country, which is what I, I am in charge of managing from Brussels. The DEFCO program in the country is actually an essential part of the EU policy of critical engagement. And it's actually in reality the only engagement component of this policy of critical engagement. Now I'll go a bit more into detail on the DEFCO program itself. So we believe that the humanitarian situation in the country doesn't constitute a short term crisis. Rather, the underlying, cri the underlying challenges that the country is facing are structural. So we're talking about the impact of climate change, the country's limited arable land, declining soil fertility, the focus on the production of staple crops, high post-harvest losses, insufficient mechanization, and limited technical knowledge. Uh, in response to these challenges, the DEVCO program in the country covers the areas of food security, nutrition, sustainable agriculture, health, water and sanitation. And the two main objectives of this DEFCO program in the country are one, to address people's fragile food and humanitarian situation, and two, to pursue engagement and a trust building process with the civil components of the DPRK government. Um, the DEFCO program consists of five separate elements. Number one, a food security office in Pyongyang. Two, uh, what we call community-based food security projects, three partnership projects in food security, the provision of agricultural supplies and projects supporting the health and socio-economic conditions of vulnerable elderly people and people with disabilities. So I'll go into each of these separately in a bit more detail. First of all, um, what we call community-based projects in food security. These projects aim at improving vulnerable groups' food situation and resilience by introducing cooperative farms and communities to new and more efficient agricultural and environmental techniques. These projects are implemented by the few EU NGOs with a permanent office in the country. Uh, what we call partnership projects aim to establish partnerships between DPRK technical institutions working in food security related fields like research institutes, academies and universities 
and foreign institutions to build their capacities to tackle food security related problems. So these projects tackle the needs of uh, North Korean technical ministries, institutions and universities to update their knowledge and strengthen their institutional capacity in food security related issues. We also respond to the mechanization needs in the country's agricultural system by delivering supplies of agricultural equipment. So this consists of the provision to cooperative farms and communities of small and medium scale agricultural, agroforestry and food processing machinery. However, this component has actually been decreasing over the past few years due to the sanctions and also due to our policy of moving towards more transformational rather than transactional activities. So we're moving towards the, the project approach more in, instead of the delivery approach. Uh, the food security office in Pyongyang. So we fund the running of a food security office in Pyongyang staffed by two international food security experts. Without an EU delegation in the country, the two consultants working at the office are actually the only means of communication that DEVCO has with the DPRK authorities. The purpose of the Food Security Office is to increase the overall quality of DEVCO engagement with the DPRK. Its staff engage in technical dialogue with relevant DPRK authorities. They monitor DEVCO funded projects and provide regular feedback to DEVCO on areas such as the humanitarian situation and the implementation context. And finally, the other element of our program is projects with vulnerable elderly people and people with disabilities. So uh, in addition to providing much needed medical care to medical care supplies to these beneficiaries, the projects have also been successful in going beyond the immediate project level and aiming to influence government policy and social attitudes to an extent, of course, uh, it's not possible to claim a link to direct causation between these projects and changes in social attitudes towards uh, people with disabilities, for example. But uh, we have seen uh, improvements in this area over the past 10 years. For example, it's now much more common to see people with disabilities in public in the DPRK than it was about 10 years ago. Uh, finally, I will go on to implementation difficulties. So unsurprisingly, there are a few imp implementation difficulties which have a negative impact on the delivery of assistance to the country and its effectiveness. These comprise the unintended negative impact of the sanctions on the delivery of aid, difficulties of obtaining access to accurate data and of obtaining permission for thorough monitoring of projects, difficulties with local partners and the, diffi the difficulty of making an impact at the policy level and of course the current low levels of funding. Uh, on top of this the COVID-19 pandemic has led to an almost total pause of DEVCO's projects in the country. Regarding the sanctions it's true that they are unintentionally affecting the delivery of aid in several ways. The, the long process of, obtain, of obtaining a sanctions derogation in order to import project supplies leads to project delays and imposes an extra administrative burden on implementing organizations, although it is true that the process has improved slightly lately. The sanctions have also meant that there is no banking channel to transfer funds from abroad, leading to a situation where organizations active in the country have to regularly physically bring cash into the country, usually from China, which also creates an extra financial burden on organizations and leads to project delays. So in conclusion, despite the difficulties and low funding levels, our DPRK program does achieve results and aid manages to reach the most vulnerable in the country. And aside from these results, the process of implementing the program in itself represents the main existing communication channel between the DPRK authorities and the EU. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, and our next uh, discussant will be Nikki Ellsford from the University of Central Lancaster. Nikki? Um, hi, yeah, so I'm Nikki Ellsford. I'm the professor in Asia Pacific Studies at the University of Central Lancashire. Um, I wanna first kind of thank um, kind of the speakers for very interesting and quite complementary um, papers, which makes the role of a discussion that little bit easier, particularly given our five minute 
um, time. Um, so I want to kind of perhaps just like look at this and some of the similarities between the papers and see how we can kind of move forward from that. So I think kind of one of the key things that came out that I found from each of these papers was this notion of decentralization or the importance that we, the importance of how North Korea moves to decentralize um, its economy and its society. Um, but I think equally listening to the papers, um, we also have a very strong need to not centralize our approaches to understanding North Korea. If we take kind of very interesting work of, uh, of Park and seeing how North Korea in terms of its health sectors, it's not necessarily dependent on approaches, but then uh, then Professor Lim, Sojin Lim, looking at this in terms of the context of fragility, sees that in areas of resilience, perhaps, that there is a, a strong need of um, assistance. So here we could have this one, this one location, this one country that both simultaneously needs and don't need. So I think we need to be careful that we don't perhaps make a very centralised approach in our understanding of North Korea. I think the other key thing that kind of come from this is this idea of that the development of North Korea is not static. We're seeing significant changes happening at at certain moments. I think the the whole way in which that the the DPRK is managing um, the the aspects of the coronavirus is very clear that we when we are projecting a developmental model of North Korea. There are variables that we need to be taking into consideration now that perhaps haven't need to be taken into consideration in other locations where we have seen movements of a command economy to more socialist orientated economies. Um, I, I very much like Kevin's paper by looking at kind of similarities with China um, and seeing how kind of we they've moved forward on their economies and they provide uh, models, potential models, particularly more in terms of the, the, the political side. This haven't seen with the rising middle class. We haven't seen changes or a, any of change within within China, whereas this offers an opportunity for North Korea. But I think perhaps um, another useful kind of model of comparison would be Vietnam um, in terms of its economic development and also in terms of the way in which its society. We've seen a very a very successful management um, within Vietnam to do with COVID-19 um, and uh, is often one that tends to get neglected within the press. So perhaps this could also be another area um, that could be taken into consideration in any future work. Um, I think also quite key to the developments of these in the periods of the times of which that, you, that Kevin was talking about um, was the creation of the stock exchange. I mean, um, so we saw the reopening or the re-establishment re of the stock exchange um, in China in 1990, and we saw a similar thing around the late 1980s and 1990s in Vietnam. And these were quite important for this movement from a command economy to socialist oriented economy. So if we're looking at this in the context of the DPRK, we can see that perhaps it's not yet quite ready for one. So we need to start thinking perhaps how that can be. So I'm just because I'm very conscious of, of, of our time and it's quite a lot that I would like to say, but um, I think perhaps one of the things that, you know, just to kind of bring it all back together, I think it's important that um, we don't compartmentalize the DPRK and perhaps there is a need for a DPRK approach um, to understanding socioeconomic development. Perhaps we're not going to see something that we've seen before. Perhaps we can potentially see something different. But I think um, in order for us to look at this, I mean, there are two scenarios. One is under sanctions and the other is in post sanctions. And I think mm -hmm. that the models of development could vary depending upon the pathway um, that, that is ongoing. And another key area, and one that I pose as a question really to our speakers, is how can we see changes in their, in their outlooks of their papers and their arguments if we were to see change in leadership um, in the context of North Korea? Um, because this could in future be another kind of uh, development that could have an effect either way on how it develops. Um, so I, I, I just conclude with I think that the six the success the success or successful development <clears throat> of the DPRK 
um, does rest on the non-traditional security. And I think that that was clearly outlined in all three of the papers. So I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Professor Alsfer. Our next speaker is Professor Owen Miller of the University of London School of Oriental and African uh, Studies. Professor Hello. Miller. Hi, good, good morning and also good afternoon and good uh, middle of the night to you, I guess, uh, Mike. <laughs> um, yeah, so I should uh, say, I think Michael has already introduced me. I, I'm a historian at uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. I specialize in, in modern Korean history. So I kind of pre preface what I'm going to say with the disclaimer that, uh, that as a historian, I don't work on uh, contemporary North Korea. Um, I work on historical North Korea, um, and I don't, I know, um, I'm not an expert on what is going on right now. But um, hopefully I can bring some uh, a different um, approach here. I think um, what I'm going to do is just, just make some comments on some of the particular aspects of these papers that I found most insightful and interesting, and then uh, add some questions for each of the uh, each of the speakers. So yeah, I'd like to say start off that, that all three of the papers had something very interesting that I learned um, and were very very useful. I think, and as as Nikki has already said, I think they were they were quite complementary, although covering each uh, a different type of sector. So um, the first thing I wanted to to comment on is to talk about um, Kevin Gray's paper, and. Uh, there's a lot of interesting detail here, and uh, you know it's 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 something that I think people outside uh, of of Korean studies, outside of expertise on North Korea, would really be quite um, surprised to hear, in a way, just how much North Korea has been carrying out in a sort of under the radar kind of way these uh, economic reforms. Um, I wanted to pick up on one thing that Kevin said, which is about uh, the the fallacy, perhaps, of comparing um, North Korea and China in, in this way. And he pointed out a few a few problems here. Now, I, I mean, I I absolutely think that the the comparison is a useful thing to do. And of course, in academic work, we constantly make comparisons, and those comparisons are probably never going to be perfect comparisons between commensurate, uh, you know, examples. Um, but certainly in this case, I think there are quite a number of problems, some of which Kevin already pointed out with making this comparison. I think I would add one further com problem, which is the sort of <clears throat> the problem of scale, the problem of, of, of the geopolitical conditions in which the two countries have found themselves, particularly in terms of scale. I mean, um, all throughout uh, East Asian history, we can make comparisons between China uh, and Korea in, in whichever particular period you want to look at, but there's always the problem of, of scale. <laughs> These vastly, vastly different um, countries at different, at different scales. Just the fact that China has multiple borders covering thousands and thousands of kilometers uh, can tell you something about how, how different in scale these two countries are. Um, so that's one thing. I think the other thing I wanted to, to bring up in terms of this possible problems with comparison is, is the question of, uh, of the geopolitical conditions. Certainly, North Korea, I think, I, I, don't know, I, I hesitate to use the word unique, but North Korea finds itself in a geopolitical bind which not many countries would find themselves in in the 20th or 21st centuries. And certainly China in the 1980s was not in that geopolitical bind that North Korea is, is in and has been in for some decades now, at least since the end of the, the Cold War. So I think that's an important thing to take into account. The, the question that I wanted to raise with, um, with Kevin is about something about the effects on the ground. This is obviously a hugely difficult thing to answer, but when changes like this are being made, they must have uh, uh, sort of real effects on the ground uh, in, in North Korea. Particularly, I I'm interested to know, you know, who, who does he think loses from this? If, if these reforms are happening, um, there must, to some extent, be winners and losers. And who is going to find this most difficult uh, on the ground in, in North Korea um, with these kind of enterprise reforms? Okay, second, then I move on to talk about um, Dr. Sojin Lim's paper. 
Um, the thing I found most interesting here is the fact, and again, I think this is one of those things you might, people outside of, uh, you know, knowing much about North Korea might find surprising, that North Korea has actively been engaging with the sustainable development goals. So here we have this sort of issue that sometimes North Korea is presented as being so far outside of the norm, so far outside of international um, kind of uh, discourses and institutions and so on, that how could they possibly... Uh, engage with something like sustainable development goals and so on. And of course, you know, that, that's obviously uh, not the case. It's quite capable of engaging with these things. But um, I think that's a very interesting point that needs to be got across. And it would be actually interesting to go more deeply into how they engaged. You know, how do they understand the language of sustainable development? What does it mean in the North Korean context? Is it a superficial engagement or is it a deep engagement where they're really uh, getting to grips with what these um, these concepts use in sort of development studies um, discourse, what, what they actually mean. So that's an interesting thing. My question for Sojin is really about um, uh, how could the change that she's envisaging happen? What are the conditions in which it could happen? Uh, for me, I feel a bit pessimistic, to be honest. Um, there's been a lot of kind of... Um, there's been a lot of, what's the right word, hullabaloo and kind of um, spectacle around the Trump administration and, and possible changes between in international relations around North Korea, in relations between North Korea and, and the US. And we can see that it's come to absolutely nothing. What are the conditions in which this kind of shift to a different uh, approach to North Korea, to an easing of sanctions, to an approach focused on sustainable development goals and so on? What are those political conditions? It strikes me that in South Korea, the political conditions may be right at the moment, or, or for, a sh for a short time longer, possibly, for a long, we don't know. Um, but it's very hard to see conditions changing much in, to, in the US, even if there's a change of, of, of president this year, or rather next year. Okay, finally, just moving on to Dr. Park's um, <clears throat> talk uh, on the health sector. This is absolutely fascinating. I've been fascinated by the North Korean health sector ever since, I think, probably 1999 or 2000. I went to a talk in Seoul about, um, about medical aid in North Korea and I found it fascinating since then. I think the thing I wanted to pull out of your talk that I found most telling and, and fascinating is this fact that they have put health over the economy, as you put it. And this is something that's been a matter of debate all over the world, I think, uh, in the COVID crisis. It's certainly been a, bait, a matter of debate here in the UK. The critics of, of our government, uh, well, there are many, many reasons to criticise our government, but one of the reasons they've been criticised is for not putting health above the economy enough and for constantly coming back and saying, well, we need to think about the economy. And this has been, a, as I said, it's been a refrain everywhere in the world. So it's fascinating that in North Korea, in your opinion, it's quite clear that health has come before the economy. I'm interested to know what kind of what lies behind that. So I suppose um, this is my question in a way. W what is it that's behind that? It would be easy for us to reach just simply for ideology and say, oh, it's because they have this background of, of socialism and because, and so on and so on. I think that may be too simple. Why has it, why is it that health and the health sector has retained this, you know, extreme importance in North Korean society and for the state to invest in? all the way through the changes that have happened, the end of the Cold War, the crisis of the 1990s, the marketization of the economy, the changes in, um, in the leadership and so on. Why has it retained that importance, which seems to just go beyond a simple, to me, beyond a simple sort of ideological um, explanation going back to some kind of social contract that was created back in the 40s and 50s? So I guess that's my, my question there. Uh, I'm also curious to know, but this is just a sort of sideline question, whether there is any uh, information or intelligence about what is actually happening on the ground with COVID-19 in, in North Korea at the moment. But yes, thank you for all three very interesting papers. Uh, thank you, Professor Ong. And in our next and our last discussant is uh, Professor Rudiger Frank from the University of Vienna. Professor Frank. Thank you and um, hello to everybody. I just wanted to add to my introduction. Um, I'm a professor of East Asian Economy and Society here in Vienna. 
And uh, the first time I actually was in North Korea was 29 years ago, when I spent half a year in Pyongyang as a language student. And I've been visiting the country ever since, um, relatively re regularly, actually. And uh, this is how I evaluate what's going on in North Korea on the ground. I don't compare North Korea to South Korea, which is silly. I compare North Korea to itself a couple of years ago, which means that my evaluation of the actual situation there, as grim as it might be, is still a bit more positive than the evaluation of people who enter somehow from a side and then just uh, apply whatever standards they have to North Korea, and then the country usually doesn't do very well. Now, uh, in terms of my comments, I will also start with the comparison of uh, China and North Korea, which I think is the obvious thing to do, obviously, to do similar systems at some point, neighboring countries as well. We know that Kim Jong-il traveled to China in 1983 to see what was going on there and boom, in 1984, we have the North Korean joint venture law. So it's relatively easy to also see that North Korea is indeed trying to learn from China. However, I'd also like to echo the uh, comments made by previous commentator that there are huge differences and I think we really should be aware of them in order to avoid the pitfall of drawing these two simple analogies. Number one, in China, when the reform started under Deng Xiaoping, uh, there was an official announcement that now we are going to reform, whereas in North Korea, nothing like this has ever happened. Um, actually, the Nodong Shinmun explicitly wrote at some point, we have nothing to reform in open, which was a direct reference to that uh, Chinese formulation. So this is something that we are still waiting for. And it's important because it means that citizens in the, in the country, they don't really know, is that now the official line or is it not? And you know how dangerous it, it can be not being on the official line. So there is this kind of very careful approach also to reforms. Then secondly, um, the um, structure of the economy at the point when reforms began. In China, about 70% of the workforce in the late 1970s were employed in agriculture. So a, a reform you do in industry affects only 30% of your population. In North Korea, it's exactly the other way around. About 70% are uh, either in manufacturing or in service which means that a reform there, including possible mistakes, will have a much bigger effect on the overall economy. And therefore, I think this will also impact the willingness of the leadership to take risks. So obviously, we have to expect a somewhat different approach in North Korea to that question. And then the third point out of many others that I could make is the external environment. And I'm not talking about geopolitics or something. I'm talking about the attitude of the West towards reforms. When the Chinese started in late 70s, 80s, or early 80s, everyone in the West was so supportive. Why? Well, for obvious reasons. They wanted to bring the socialist system down. And by supporting this kind of market-oriented reforms in China, you could drive a wedge between those socialist countries, perhaps set an example. And uh, well, we know history. Uh, Gorbachev tried to follow a Chinese example. He failed. The Soviet Union fell apart. And that was it with socialism. Now, if you turn to North Korea, think about the July measures of 2002. Nobody did a thing about supporting that. On the contrary, North Koreans have now, I think, about 30 special economic zones, and no major Western company is investing there, which is ridiculous. You know, we talk about how they should reform, and then on the other hand, we don't support them. Now, I know the argument, right? Now, the proceeds from that could be used for the nuclear program, and how can we do that, and all the rest of it. But frankly, First of all, that's ridiculous. And secondly, it's a major difference between the North Korean and the Chinese case. Um, the other two presentations, I think they were actually pretty nicely also related to each other. So let me just finish with one um, rather general remark uh, that I still think applies to both of them. Um, when it comes to using numbers and figures and indexes on North Korea, um, SDGs um, are, it's, it's a great idea to actually use them as a benchmark, as an analytical framework. They are well known, you know, you will get a lot of public attention and traction. Um, but still, I find this kind of indexes and many others very, very questionable for a number of reasons. Number one, we don't have much information on North Korea in terms of hard facts as we have them on other countries, which means that if you look at the details and very few people do that, that's the big problem. If you try to kind of deconstruct those indexes, you see that very often North Korea gets a value of zero. Zero, not because it's actually zero, but because no evidence could be found. And that means that if you have a list of 197 countries, North Korea usually ends up being 
196 or something, which uh, simply doesn't correspond with the facts. I would argue for uh, looking at uh, numbers that are as precise as possible, rather than saying welfare of the population, you could look at life expectancy, child mortality, um, access to uh, clean water, average calorie intake per day. And then you will actually see very surprising results that North Korea somehow ranks in the middle uh, of uh, a whole set of countries. Of course, unless you take the OECD countries as a reference point, then they will be last. Um, I was personally involved, you know, doing this for three decades, it's inevitable, in uh, contributing to some of those indexes. And something very strange happened to me. Um, I, you know, provided these data. It's not that I made them up or something, they are available. And then the editors of those indexes, they were just very unhappy with the result because North Korea suddenly didn't end up last. So what happened was that um, they simply didn't invite me again next year to contribute to those indexes. That was good for me. It saved me lots of time. But um, obviously, it's not really good for those who consume those indexes. They don't take the time to actually deconstruct them and then basically end up assuming that North Korea is just a hopeless country, failed state, etc. And that is simply not reality. And that means that our policies are not created appropriately. I remember one of the speakers also said that uh, perhaps they are not as much affected by sanctions as we might think, because the, the uh, economy is much more self-sustainable and stable than it might seem to be. We all know it's in a very problematic state. There's no doubt about that. And there's a lot of human suffering and that uh, actually the UN sanctions are making it worse. But then again, there are countries uh, doing much worse and our hope that eventually people will rise up against their government, kick them out and replace them with some kind of pro-Western government. I think it's actually pretty naive and I think we do need a new policy and I strongly agree with the suggestions that our uh, speakers have made. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you very much, Dr. Professor Frank. Um, we now have a little time for discussion. And just before we do, I just want to add a little personal note here uh, before becoming a college professor. I worked uh, in developing countries for a number of years. And uh, I'm I find this very interesting because we are focusing here on North Korea as a developing country. We're developed as a fragile country with a very challenging set of uh, uh, confronting a lot of challenges maybe some of them kind of unique or singular challenges uh, and, uh, and its economic development. And as an historian, I would like to um, reiterate some of the points that have been made here that when we deal with uh, North Korea, we are dealing with a country whose historical development, its structure, its geopolitical situation makes it difficult uh, to have, to compare with other developing countries. And I think this has been uh, pointed out. And uh, well, from there, I'd like to open it up. Do we have comments, questions? Could, could I perhaps, should we respond to some of the comments that have been made already? Please, please. Um, I, I, okay, so I'll, I'll start off. Um, so I think uh, Professor Kim talked to, had a question to me about the relationship between um, economic reform and and geopolitics, I guess, and, and, and um, how these are interconnected. I mean, I think this was a, a feature of the literature, um, particularly in relation to the 7-1 reforms 2002, um, in the sense that it was often argued that it was a relatively benign international environment at that time. North Korea had the sort of the courage, if, if you like, to, to proceed on a process of, of, you might say, limited reform. But then as the situation worsened in the late 2000s, then they shifted towards this more sort of um, conser conservative, I think, Professor Frank, what did one of your papers called it socialist neo Conservatism, something, something like that. Anyway, but I think that was that was a, that was an argument that was made in the in, in in the literature in the past. But I think one of the sort of arguments, one of the problems we have now is, of course, that the the Kim Jong Un reform reforms have probably been the boldest that North Korea has taken. Um, but at, at a time when its geopolitical relations were very poor, if we go back to the beginning of the sort of Kim Jong-un uh, uh, era. Um, 
So that relationship doesn't really hold them between economic reform and, 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 and geopolitics. I mean, of course, some of the reforms won't work, right? Special economic zones. Um, within the enterprise law, there's a, there's a, there's a clause for joint ventures and, 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 and enterprises are now allowed to trade. It doesn't have to be just a trading company. Um, but now, of course, the North Korean government is emphasizing sort of import substitution, right? You know, talking about the import disease. So those kind of things work. But I think a lot of what I was talking about in relation to sort of corporate governance, that doesn't really necessarily depend on what the external environment is like. Those are more internally focused reforms that are really just about trying to um, increase incentives uh, and, and decision making rights for, for lower, lower levels. Um, so, and, and so I think in some ways these reforms, it, the more adverse the environment is and the harder the situation gets in the economy, the, the state sees, still nonetheless sees them as important. And, and there are links also with sort of science and technology policy, which is a very important part of North Korean discourse these days. Um, so I don't think that relationship necessarily holds for the broad swathe of sort of state and enterprise reforms that I was talking about. On comparison, of course, I, you know, I fully accept um, um, North Korea is not China. There are huge differences. I think we need to think about comparative methodology and what we're trying to achieve. And I think there's enough to say that, well, they share very, uh, particularly earlier on, 1950s, very similar sort of uh, industrialization policies, uh, self-sufficiency, all this kind of thing. You know, North Korea shared the concepts of the mass line and all this kind of stuff. But of course, the, the purpose of showing doing the comparison is also to highlight what the differences are and what what roles these play and so it's about isolating those particular variables and as as um uh owen professor miller as as you said i mean there's an issue about scale and it's and, and why that's important is because in china there was decentralization to provincial and local governments and that brought in a completely new sort of dynamic where you had what they talked about local local developmental states so there was competition between states uh, provincial local states um, which you don't see in a in a much smaller country um, and geopolitics uh, yeah i mean north korea has been very unlucky right you know i mean china's nuclear weapons didn't seem to cause it too much trouble in normalizing its relations with the us in the 70s but then it's it, we have the situation now where the main concession that North Korea is expected to make for improved relations with the United States is precisely what it sees as defending its whole national existence. That was not a situation that was faced by China or Vietnam, and it's 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 the main sort of um, um, sticking point. And also the question about winners and losers. I mean, I, as I say, many of these reforms are, are sort of post hoc, so these are things that are happening already. Um, but I would say losers probably more associated with the broader process of marketization, which is at the same time, per se, it's 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 a process of maybe polarization might be a bit too strong, but but definitely inequality, and that's that's a, a distinct uh, social trend within North Korea because for however much you get you know, discussions about the tonju and their increasing financial wealth and power, then you get the opposite process as well about people who are losing out, out, out in this. Um, and then, um, Professor Frank, um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with most of your points, and I, I think I've responded to the point about the comparison. Um, the issue about whether it's reform, of course, North Korea is in a bit of a bind, really, because it cannot use the word reform now because it's argued so strongly against it. Um, but I, I do still feel that there's a way that they're trying to talk about reform without mentioning the R word, if you like. So, you know, they talk about um, uh, enterprises must operate in accordance with actual conditions. You know, this, this, this term actual conditions comes up a huge amount. And I think it's a code word for marketization and, 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 and uh, uh, this kind of thing, self-sufficiency as well, you know, I mean, so they're, they're trying to discuss it without discussing it in a way. But I fully accept that that creates difficulties in the sense that you know they, they cannot simply come out and, and, and announce you know like we're changing the system and and, and they're trying to do it by by stealth if you, if, if, if you see but as i say i mean reform is not just about special economic zones and things like that it's about these governance reforms as well which i don't which i think are taking place and don't necessarily require massive changes in, in, in the external environment for those reforms to to work but I, i'll stop there um, yeah. okay thank you Anyone else? I can go next based yeah. on uh, how uh, Kevin started. Um, so about the um, uh, Dongjin's comment about the uh, CDG and how um, South Korea also can 
uh, in Baltimore and also about the peace uh, in uh, goals number 16. Um, SDGs are not perfect uh, goals, but it uh, has uh, the uh, development compared to MDGs. The uh, main four pillars of uh, core values of SDG uh, included peace and um, uh, uh, conflict issues. Because you know, without peace, there will be no development. That was the one of the main uh, core values. But like the uh, no one uh, uh, leave no one behind uh, spirit in SDG, SDG itself is a uh, very ironic and uh, um, uh, not by not uh, addressing all its good uh, spirits and what it was discussed during uh, when we uh, um, created SDG goals. So because of that. Even though number 16 uh, states the peace there, it's more about the institution and accountability rather than peace itself. That's why it's more about good governance in old time. We don't use good governance uh, as a term anymore, but then now it's uh, talked as an effective institution. Uh, so that was why. But um, in the implementation process, the uh, further state and with the small G7 countries, the uh, main uh, point there being is that we need to have different approaches than other uh, developing countries for these countries in these, especially uh, under uh, conflict or post-conflict uh, situated uh, countries. So that was, that is, as I see, how we can approach to North Korea as well. But in terms of the South Korea and its current peace uh, process, we need to have the um, common uh, agreement amongst the international actors first to have this peace approach because even US and South Korea uh, don't have the same understanding of it. And each country has their own agenda based on their own national interest. So um, within the SDG framework, uh, it will be really difficult for us to bring South Korea's uh, peace process. But South Korea has a, a strong um, uh, capability and potential to conduct this as itself, as a counterpart of North Korea uh, in a uh, in a way. So that's how I saw the situation. And um, about the um, uh, Nikki's uh, question, the leadership change, um, it's rather than uh, re leadership change, it, as I see, it will be more about how people react. For example, the marketization in, marketization in the North Korea, it did not happen by top-down way by leadership, but it, it happened based on the grassroots from the gray market, uh, from the Jangmadang. So in that way, um, in North Korea, the answer for all these questions and how we can bring changes, which also relates to uh, Owen's question, will be with people. That's why we now need to think about non-traditional security sectors and we need to think about uh, more about people because they, they will be the ones who can bring uh, more changes in North Korea if uh, it will happen. So that's how I uh, thought um, about all this uh, current situation. But really, uh, all of these questions uh, will be my uh, um, next uh, research uh, uh, titles and the themes because it really uh, uh, requires uh, a lot of uh, uh, more in-depth uh, studies and efforts. Thank you. I'll go next. Yep. I, I, uh, uh, there are two specific questions and and. and, and they're somewhat related. I'll start with uh, Owen Miller's question uh, about health over economy. So, I, I you know, they have, there's a clearly a social contract, right? And it's been around for a long time. And, and then over the last uh, several years, there was the Pyongyang line, which is really the military and economic development. The health is a priority, but it's never been at the, the level it is today because of the COVID-19. And, you know, if you look at U.S.'s response, clearly the U.S. didn't take the threat very seriously, right? They will squander a lot of time. What North Korea has done instead is that they've taken this threat way too seriously, if you think about that. So, you know, they, it's, 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 it's a matter of national survival. Uh, and, and because of the threat that they feel, and it's, 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 it's beyond what I would consider scientific fear. It's almost a paranoia level. And that's how they respond to it. And that's why for them, it's, it's, it, 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 they don't even want to entertain the possibility of the virus coming in because the, the, the consequences could be just catastrophic. 
I think that uh, offers us a, actually a, 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 an opportunity. And this gets to the question by Tong Jin. He's saying, you know, we've been sending humanitarian assistance. Well, I know exactly what's, going, what's happening to those. They're, they're, they're backed up in, you know, uh, in, in, in Tandong and then in Dalian, right? Because they can't get into North Korea because if you hear what the, um, the North Koreans have said during the floods, they're saying, we're not accepting any international aid because we're afraid that COVID-19 can come in through this cargo. If you think about it, it's not really, it's almost a rational level of fear. So what, 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 what I think the practical you know, way, even before we start sending this uh, massive amounts of international aid, which clearly you know, that, that we can do that, you have to address their paranoia, and which is, has to do with this uh, irrational fear of the virus. I think that there's two things we could do for them. Uh, one is uh, uh, technical assistance, right? The WHO is in the country. I just was actually contacted by the, the, the DPRK mission wanting to know about disinfection this 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 disinfection protocols for cargo, and so you know there, there's WHO uh, literature for that, so we sent it over there. They're curious; they want to know, and what's the science behind these protocols, right? What's reasonable? What's ex excessive? I think there's an opportunity to sort of inform them and educate them with the, with the current level of science and understanding and the risks. But the other thing we could do is actually provide them with capacity capabilities to act actually screen foreigners at the Sunan airport and screen cargo at the level at Nampo and, 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 and Dalian. Give them the test kits, give them the test, you know, testing machines, set them all off for them and saying, listen, uh, here's what, what the protocol recommends. You know, you test foreigners once when they, uh, when they arrive and then let's say, you know, the protocol is once more, two negative tests and you, you come out of quarantine. Well, maybe we can sort of negotiate and say, Maybe we do three or four negative tests. It doesn't matter, right? It's give them the capacity to be able to test till they feel secure. But what's important is then they say, okay, now we'll let foreigners in, right? And take these test kits around the country and say, listen, we want to have our team monitoring our programs all over the provinces. Well, great. Here's our, we're going to take the test kits with us and say, we're going to test ourselves every two, three days to, to, to you sure that we're not carrying the virus. So I think there's some things that we can do real practically uh, to help uh, reopen the humanitarian corridor that they have really shut down. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have another question. I just want to make a, a brief comment. And I see some parallels here with uh, North Korea's uh, preoccupation with AIDS in the 1980s. I'm not sure if uh, if you're familiar with that, but in the 1980s, at least in the propaganda, there was this fear of AIDS coming into the country. Yeah, and there were parallels to uh, SARS and MERS as well. They were extremely yeah. radical in shutting their country off uh, with those two previous epidemics or pandemics. That's right. So there's clearly a pattern there. And with Ebola, they they you know they, they instituted very drastic quarantine measures, and that was continents away. So there's some patterns there. Just have a follow up question to uh, Dr. Lim, if I may. Yes. That uh, when I was talking about the UN strategic framework, at, uh, the current one from 2017 to 2021 wasn't necessarily just about the involvement of the South Korean actors in, in that particular strategic framework, but rather the decision-making process for the UN resident coordinators and UN country teams and in, in cooperation with the DPRK authorities mm -hmm. when they discuss the next strategic framework uh, and could, you know, the issue of the, the, the Korean conflict and the international sanctions be reflected in the discussion about creating a new strategic framework in relation to the SDGs, you know, or SDG 16 plus. So that, that was kind of my question and then relate to, to our situation now that I don't know the active, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but that I don't see an active role of the UN countries team at the moment um, in, in, in country that you, what, what does UN, you know, uh, resident coordinator is doing in, in terms of addressing these issues and what kind of role that, you know, the, the UN country team is taking on in terms of advising the, the, uh, the state authorities 
for example, like visas management and how to quarantine and how to screen the, the foreigners coming in and in and out. And they could be of certain help, but I, I don't hear things a lot. So um, do, you, do you have any information or, or do you think that is there a way for us to sort of envisage about the new strategic framework could, could have some sort of the, the actual attitude to deal with the situation in the changing geopolitical situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, as I see, the, uh, these, these kind of reports are process. We can't have what we want to achieve at once uh, in relation to North Korea, but at least they are trying. You, you are right, uh, there are not many like, in-depth um, uh, knowledge there. For example, when we talked about this voluntary national uh, report for the SDG progress with North Korea, when I talked with the person in charge from UN system who's writing up this report to, along with the North Korean government, they said the report for North Korea will be slightly different from other countries. It will be about baseline survey, not much more than that. Because of the current situation with the North Korean government uh, who do not want to reveal detailed data. Also on top of that, as Frank uh, mentioned, uh, the uh, Professor Frank mentioned that the data collection or survey capability is not there. So we need to come up with the capacity building uh, first if we want to have detailed reports and strategy, because strategy can come with the, uh, based on the detailed uh, data, but it's not there simply. And also uh, it's about wording, how they want to relate it, uh, relate SDG or human rights as the vocabulary within the reports. Like, for example, Chinese government, they were against to use human rights as a vocabulary, even in the uh, SDG statement. So that came up with the reuse, the split of MDG, which MDG had the human rights as a vocabulary in the statement when Chinese government they did not involve that much when MDG came out. So this kind of um, play is still there. But eventually, by doing this kind of exercise, they're going to be familiar with this international culture. And also they know that by producing same vocabulary, or by having using same language in these kind of reports, then they can bring more uh, multi uh, multinational um, assistance in the country. That was the main real national uh, interest from North Korea, why they are working with the UN um, bodies. But on top of that, it's more about how, for example, in the 1990s, this Washington consensus uh, did not work in most of African countries. You know, one size does not fit all at all from the top-down way. So it will be also need to come up with, for example, shadow reports by NGOs. In order to do that, we need to have more NGOs within North Korea to see real situation in the towns or villages rather than having city-centered um, uh, multilateral or bilateral donor agencies. So in order to have the real strategy, then we all need to work together within the one same mechanism, but it's not there yet. So as I see this kind of UN uh, strategy and a report is a process. And if we compare it from the past, there is a development, obviously, because they now use the term of um, what, uh, how international organizations are used. So I think uh, that is the way how we can uh, approach, but it can't be a fast or rapid or uh, uh, radical. It will be very slow and um, at the very uh, minor level, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, I, if I can come in just for a question. Anytime. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, I have a question for Sojin. Um, so what do you think are the SDGs that we can actually work on in DPRK, uh, North Korea, uh, considering the sanctions as they are at the moment? Where is there actually scope to, to become engaged? So in the recent uh, reports uh, produced by both uh, UN coordinators uh, and resident coordinators and um, the DPRK uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, clearly states that there is a very limit in um, uh, this kind of process and also uh, having SDGs done because of current sanctions. It is clearly mentioned in uh, 
in a few reports, uh, well, at least recent three reports I uh, presented in my uh, slides, if you remember. So it will be really difficult even for um, the humanitarian actors and uh, UNDP or UN uh, uh, coordinators, including EU, of course, to bring necessary uh, aids to achieve and show the SDG progress in North Korea because of the sanctions and all these barriers. So that is why the uh, voluntary uh, national report will be kind of the uh, baseline survey, not more than that. So that is why my argument is that we need to at least lift partially the current sanctions, then we can try any changes and help. Then if it doesn't work, then then we can uh, reconsider, uh, but we haven't tried it yet. And North Korea has been under sanctions and now it just became even wider and worse. It hasn't uh, had any opportunities to try uh, in a constructive way. That's how I uh, see. Can I respond okay. to that? Is, yeah, one, I, 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 there, I can tell you about SDG3, which is, which is hell. So, so DPRK, um, they're, um, there was a resolution in 2015 at the World Health Assembly put forth by Zambia, was co-sponsored by the US and was fully supported by the DPRK. This is one of the rare occasions where US and DPRK are on the same page and it had to do with strengthening surgical care as a component of universal health coverage. The reason I bring that up is because they promptly put those elements into their national strategic plan uh, for health, the healthcare sector. And now they're trying to uh, implement it. So there are three targets within the SDG, three, uh, three metrics. One is the maternal mortality ratio, the other one is the neonatal mortality ratio uh, rate, and the third is reduction of road injury uh, fatalities. And, and, and surgical care actually feeds into all three of those targets. So they, they've been trying to Im implement a nationwide surgical strengthening project and they were actually uh, uh, were going to start in January because they got a $5 million grant through WHO. And the funding actually came from our hosts uh, uh, from South Korea. Uh, so they was very quiet about it. But it really, that, that's where the money came from, $5 million. So, you know, there's all this stuff happening. Now, the project is on hold because of COVID, right? But uh, as soon as the, 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 the circumstances allow, they're going to proceed with that. And then the, the idea is the second phase is we're hoping other funders from Europe, hopefully, uh, to sort of take up the slack. And, and then the North Korea has actually said they'll co-finance the second phase of it up to 20 percent. So there's, there could, there's a lot of uh, potential for collaboration and cooperation, uh, at least on the health sector. Thanks. Uh, yeah, just looking at the SDGs, uh, looking at the list, I mean, I would say that it's possible to to do work in almost all of them, actually, except um, um, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth is definitely no, and e industry innovation and infrastructure, that would not be allowed either. Um, but I mean, I th partnership for the goals, no, but the, the others, I think there is quite a lot of scope, even within the sanctions, to do limited work under each goal but i think the real problem is the amount of funds available is the european commission going to chip in some money <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got, we have funding problems of our own actually but yeah <laughs> we can find some more, some more money but that, I think that in terms of the availability of the funding is also um, a problem. I mean, it, it's it's a problem, but then also we have to think about the international sanctions uh, as as Dr. Schwartz mm. pointed out, and and then the risking of the banking sectors, and and it's it's incredibly difficult uh, for us to provide aid, even if we have the funding. And then mm -hmm. it's it's highly complicated now. Uh, as I mentioned, in, you know, ninety percent of the North Korean trade is supposed to be under sanction. So how could we, without the coordination, for example, within the UN systems that the UN is sanctioning UN work within North Korea, and and in the people in Moonstone, they have the interagency meetings every Friday, 
and and then they discuss these issues and then of course the problem the airport came comes out and then it's saying that the lack of availability of the fundings but at, at the same time we have to really think about how to really uh, implement those strategy uh, and strategy framework of reference to SDGs under the international sanctions regime and as, as Dr. Park mentioned that Yes, there has been progress in terms of the humanitarian exemption process in, in, with the UN Security Council Committee, S Sanctions Committee. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still quite difficult for all the in, you know, humanitarian actors to apply for the humanitarian exemption process, and even if it's been expedited. So there should be certainly some sort of coordination mechanisms between the humanitarian sectors and the international sanctions, you know, and then the sanctions committee. Yes. Yeah, and also we need to also think about the practical um, uh, practicality there. For example, uh, because Jung, Dongjin just mentioned about the finance uh, financial sector, um, when these uh, aid workers uh, come in North Korea under normal situation without COVID-19 uh, and work there, the, uh, for the humanitarian aid and all this finance coming into North Korea, the, uh, one of the issues, as I understand, was how to transfer the money to the right place. The North Korean uh, financial sector and the banking system is not like um, what they do international at the international standard. And uh, from my experience, uh, when I used to work for the aid agency, I had to uh, fly to Palestine, uh, Palestine. But because of this uh, different regulation, uh, in between Israel and Palestine, I had to bring cash with me on a flight to pay for the workers working in the Palestine from my government side because they could not have uh, international transfer for their salary to work there. So this is about the practicality of the people who come into North Korea and because they, they also uh, need to be paid. And so about the security as well. So all this practicality um, will be uh, better eventually. So that really need to be uh, sorted out. And under this uh, sanction uh, regime, it's really difficult to address all of these things. And even in health sector, as I understand, even though um, North Korea is successful to have this big uh, hospital, general hospital in Pyongyang, it will be really to give access to the limited privileged people, not for the rest of the people. And also North Korea doesn't have national uh, universal insurance system. So it will not benefit uh, for the rest of the people. People will not have access to this general hospital. And for example, one X-ray uh, machine, as uh, Key mentioned, so all imported and then you have to change the films and then you have to buy the films uh, again and again. So all these things, you know, after you have the machine once, then how you can maintain and sustain it. It's also a problem and question. So all these things, if even though they have the exemption from the current sanction one time and bringing these machines, but the second time when they need um, new films for the X-ray or these things, how they can do that? So they have to apply for the new exemption again and again. It's not sustainable at all. So it's it's really about this how we can achieve the sustainability, and we need to think about this current sanction regime in a different way. Uh, really, if we want to think about and leave no one behind in terms of the civilians in North Korea. So that is, I think. Uh, Again and again, I'm repeating, I think, that the importance of we consider uh, the current sanction for the sake of people, not for uh, the uh, uh, limited number of people, because sanction haven't, sanctions haven't worked for last more than two decades now. Well, do I hear any other comments? We have a, just have a couple of minutes left. If anyone has a something, yeah, maybe I could oh, maybe I could uh, talk in if I may. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. On the on the um, hospital in Pyongyang, um, from a source that I can't really disclose here, I heard that the South Korean government was willing to supply technical equipment and stuff, and the North Koreans actually refused that and they said, well, you rather give us the money because then we can buy it in China. Now, this could be interpreted as a typical refusal to accept direct South Korean uh, support. Mm -hmm. But I think it might also be tied to what uh, Professor Lim just said on the sanctions 
uh, and supplies because if the uh, all this, the the uh, equipment comes from China, it would be much easier actually to get uh, spare parts and supplies etc. Et compared to when the equipment would be based on the technical standards of South Korea. So mm -hmm. as you see, they are aware of the fact that they're also trying to find workarounds to that. Um, a, a question I would have to uh, Professor Gray, since you mentioned the uh, Dayan system that has been eliminated from North Korea's constitution. Uh, there have been two more elements that have been there since I think the 1960s or something. Uh, the um, Cholima Undong or the uh, Cholima movement and the Chongsali or Chongsanri, sometimes it's called like that, uh, system in agriculture. I think they also have been eliminated, um, but not this time, but even earlier, actually. Would you perhaps like to comment on that and put this final scrapping of the Dayan system somehow in perspective? Do you see any connection to that, like more of a long-term um, drive to modernize North Korea's economy, or is it more of a short-term thing oriented at? Uh, modernizing uh, industry and uh, government industry relations. Yeah, uh, shall I answer that now? Um, I think, uh, yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, the Tolima uh, movement, of course, um, it's it has its sort of modern manifestations, if you think of it primarily in terms of uh, a, a mass mobilization. Um, I think um, 2016 i think was probably the last time it was made a big sort of national thing and they had the um, i can't remember there was the 200 day battle and there was a, a 70 day battle both in those years so they're they're um they're, they're, they still obviously exist in some form or other but um the tong sang ni uh, method um as i understand it uh, i mean it's gone the same way as the taean system because if you think about what they were both of them were primarily um sort of party systems for facilitating the party's role in economic management and that kind of on a de facto basis sort of ended in the 1990s or became much weaker anyway because of the whole move towards marketization so i think or even before the the, the reforms under kim jong un they they had become kind of somewhat meaningless even though uh, i mean the chong sang ni um the farm itself. I mean, I was there in 2014, and it's, and it's still this kind of sacred holy ground that you that North Koreans travel and uh, they go and to learn about the systems of, of economic management. But uh, as I'm sure you're aware, there's there's under Kim Jong Un, there's been a, a shift towards um, this kind of filled responsibility management system, um, which uh, 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 sort of is is a broad approximation of, of the household responsibility system in China as well. So there's been, there's been a, sh a, a shift away in that as well. Um, so, so yeah, the Chong Sang Ni system and the Taeyan work system, they, they were both sort of systems of the early 60s, party dominated control. And, and we see because of the role of sort of decentralization in both agriculture and industry, they, they've both been effectively done away with. Um, so, so yeah, it's part of the same movement. But thank you. Is there any other questions? In that case, I think we'll wrap this up and bring this uh, session to an end. Uh, I want to thank all our participants in this for what has been an extremely interesting, well-informed, uh, focused discussion. And thank and thank our host and. And thank you to thank our you. chair. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.